Thank you for participating in tonight's Q&A with Richmond-based filmmaker David Powers. Um, I've known David for a few years, and we've had some gr really great chats, um, especially about you know doc versus narrative, um, marketing and distribution, and you know that whole uh, game of Jenga um, or <laughs> or reverse Jenga, I, I should say. Um, but first, I'd like to shout out to Sona Bank. Um, they are Virginia Production Alliance's newest sponsor. Uh, we're really looking forward to partnering with them on upcoming VPA programming, including their power program for women entrepreneurs. Uh, they've got branches in Northern Virginia, Hampton Roads and Richmond. So they're going to be um, right in your backyard. Uh, please support our sponsors because they support filmmakers like you and filmmaking in Virginia. Um, next up, I just want to mention our membership drive. Um, those who paid for tonight's program, now is the time to join the VPA. Uh, it's $35 for new members. Um, click on the link in the chat for the discount. We're looking to grow membership leading up to the next General Assembly session so we can rally and support legislative action for filmmaking here in Virginia. And there's a lot of um, shows going on right now. Um, there's at least three series that's on tap. Um, and of course, um, documentaries uh, like David's. Um, just for a little bit of housekeeping um, for the format tonight, um, I'm going to ask David a bunch of questions while everyone is muted. So please use the chat function for any questions during the presentation. Then we'll open it up to live Q&A. Um, I want to keep this first part around 45 minutes to give everyone a chance to ask David their questions live and in person. And in case you don't know me, my name is Michael Ivey. I'm the president of the Virginia Production Alliance this year. Um, you know, us on the board, we're, we're trying to do some new things and deal with COVID the best that we can in order to keep programming, going to the membership and um, making sure that you're getting your membership value. And now, David Powers, welcome. Thank you. Glad to be invited. Uh, David is the founding president of Bell Tower Pictures, a Richmond-based nonprofit film production company. Um, he's traveled and worked in 25 countries on five continents and throughout the United States producing documentaries, music videos, television specials, feature films, in which we're going to be talking about two of them. Um, he wrote and, and directed Bill Tower's first feature, By the Grace of Bob, which was released in 16, 2016, that is. Uh, David produced the current Bill Tower project, Heard, a documentary which captures the inspiring stories of four people who grew up in the projects um, and uh, how they're surviving and thriving in spite of their backgrounds and often because of the challenges they've had to overcome. Um, the film was produced in partnership with VPM, Virginia's Home for, Pu Home for Public Media, uh, which we'll talk about that partnership a little bit as well. And it will air in Central Virginia on November 12th at 9 p.m. So David, how did you get this far? Tell us about your journey. <laughs> Um, <clears throat> well, I've always had an interest in broadcasting, and, and most of my career has been centered around that. Uh, started in radio when I was in high school. My first job out of college was in television news, and uh, got pretty bored and burned out and disillusioned with that uh, after not long. Mm -hmm. I just didn't see any long-term uh, uh, satisfaction, personal satisfaction and fulfillment in that. Ended up going to seminary. Um, and uh, then spent the bulk of my career from then on, from 1980 on, in uh, religious church-related uh, institutions, worked uh, on two church staffs, and then came to Richmond in 87 to work in the production department of the Baptist Foreign Mission Board, now called the International Mission Board, mm -hmm. um, and then joined the staff of First Baptist Church here in Richmond in 93 and took early retirement uh, in uh, 2013. So it's, it's, been, it's been a fun ride, most of it here in Richmond, and uh, I've had an opportunity to do a lot of different kinds of things, uh, and I'm, I'm grateful for those opportunities. Yeah. So, um, you know, when you went to seminar, seminary, did you take a break from, from broadcasts and media, or were you still kind of dabbling in that? And then when you started, you know, here in Richmond, I mean, is it kind of your, you're going back to your passion? Uh, it's kind of, sort of, yeah. I um, 
you know, interesting. I, I chose to go to the seminary in Fort Worth, Texas, because our denomination's radio and television broadcast hub was in Fort Worth. And I thought, well, I've got experience and I've got a degree in it. I can get a job there while I'm in seminary. Well, when I got there, I discovered, you know, they don't want no stinking seminary students working in their studio. <laughs> so it just, it didn't work out that way. I weren't, wound up working in a bookstore for a while, actually. Um, but that, that was all good. Eventually did some work well, with them. But I, I had the, ex, you know, the basis of experience and the, and the formal education in, in uh, mass communication, television, radio, film production. And so that was a good opportunity to kind of hang the theological skin on that skeleton. And that has, that has served me well to, to kind of guide my purpose and direction in, in what I've been doing. Mm-hmm. And, you know, that kind of leads into Bell Tower Pictures, where, you know, you, you recently produced Herd. Um, I just watched it this past weekend as part of the Virginia Film Festival, uh, right before it premieres uh, in a couple of weeks on local PBS stations. And, and you know, where did, where did this concept come from? Like, you know, was it your surroundings? Were you reading headlines? That, that played a part in it. I was actually doing a video project and I needed some footage of low income housing. And uh, so, you know, I'm thinking, well, where can I get some, some of that footage? And I thought, well, I've heard about Gilpin Court because I, I get the newspaper and I read that people get shot there regularly. And uh, I know it's one of the big six housing projects. That's just about all I knew about it. I didn't even know where it was located, to be honest with you. Mm. So I, I looked it up on Google Maps and took my camera and, and pulled into Gilpin Court and realized it's right on 95. And I've driven past it like a thousand times, but never turned right to go in there. And when I pulled in there, I, there was something, maybe it was because I realized that I was in the place behind all the headlines where people kept getting shot every weekend and I look around and there's a menacing group of guys standing over here under a tree. And, Mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm a, I'm a old white guy. Uh, so it just, it felt, and I've, you know, I've, I've traveled a lot and I've been in some pretty dicey situations overseas where safety was not uh, guaranteed, Mm -hmm. but something about that environment, just for some reason, um, because primarily I know now of my preconceptions, many of which were erroneous, Mm-hmm. I felt really unsafe and I began to ask, well, why is it like this and how did we get here? And then, you know, the storyteller in me, my interest was piqued and I thought, well, are there some stories? And, and yes, there are. So I started investigating and doing research and talking to anybody that would that would sit down and talk to me about the, the public housing situation, how we got there discovered there were a lot of good documentaries and a lot of great books and websites and information about why why it's like that and how we got here. Uh, I couldn't find a lot of material on the people. And I thought, there's there's the niche right there. Let's let's tell people stories. And so that kind of set our direction. We decided to 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 find a number of people who would be willing to open their door and share their lives with us. And we would just let them tell their stories of life growing up in in the projects and and what it's been like and, and where they are and where they're going. And so we found a handful of really good people, gracious people who allowed us to do that. And there's no narrator. There's no pie charts and graphs that explain the, the history of it uh, to the consternation of some, because there were some who wanted us to go that direction. Uh, but we said, no, we're going we're gonna to let folks, we're just going to hand them a microphone. We're going to let them tell their own stories and weave it together. And so that's, um, that's what we did. And uh, our exceptionally gifted director, DP, and editor, Martin Montgomery, uh, really wove these stories together in a compelling manner, if, if I do say so myself. <laughs> so, so I wanted to ask you, where did you find, you know, the hand, handful of people? I mean, obviously, Vaughn jumps off the screen, you know, and, and you know, there's so many people that, um, that you hear their stories, uh, and they're all unique. But, you know, as as you said, as you know, as an older white gentleman, you know, where where's was that a barrier for meeting these people, meeting the subject matters, and how was that a um, how how did you have to sell the fact that you wanted to do a documentary about them? Um, it, it was a it was a bit of a barrier, uh, 
more so for the gatekeepers than for the folks who out, who ended up being our storytellers. Mm-hmm. Um, we discovered that a lot of the folks who work um, within RRHA, the Housing Authority, <clears throat> and folks who work with some of the nonprofits and service organizations are justifiably protective of the folks that they work with because so many people have gone in there with good intentions and wreaked havoc. And people go in to meet their needs, even, even good organizations like, like VCU, a class will go in there to do some surveying. And so they go in and they do their survey and they disappear and you never see them or hear from them again. And the people who invest some of their time and energy to help them, like, okay, well, what came of that, you know? So there's a lot of skepticism about people coming in to help uh, because not all the motives are great. And, and even when the motives are great, some of the outcomes are not, uh, are not what people intended. Um, we, we tend, when I say we, I mean suburban middle-class white folks, I have discovered, tend to go in and solve the problems. And that's, that's not the solution that's called for. It's, it's not a matter of going in and let me tell you, stand over there and let me tell you how to solve your problems. That is not the way to get it done. So uh, in the face of that kind of um, history, we did have a little bit of resistance, but you know, we just decided we were going to be honest. The, the, we, we kept telling people, you know, we don't have an agenda here. We're not trying to raise money for any organization. We're not trying to push any legislative agenda or that, that's not what we're about. We're storytellers. I would, I would say, you know, I, I see the situation here. If I, were a, if I were an entrepreneur, I might open a business in Gilpin Court and hire folks from the community. Or if I were a medical doctor or a dentist, I might open a practice there and, and try to tailor it to cater to those folks. But I'm, I'm not. I'm a filmmaker. I'm a storyteller. So how can I use what I'm gifted to do? And that's to, to uh, basically tell, tell their stories or let them tell their stories. Um, and so once they began to see that we were shooting straight with them and we were going to be around for a while, I mean, we, we shot this thing over the course of more than a year. So we spent a lot of time with folks. Mm-hmm. They began to, to see that we were honest and, and transparent and um, that we were doing what we said we were going to do. And gradually those barriers fell down. Um, and, and now, you know, the folks, the, the five primary storytellers, um, one of them, Miss Gwen, kind of serves as the narrator to tie it all together. Mm-hmm. And then we dive into these other four folks' uh, life stories pretty deep. Uh, I, I consider them friends. Um, you know, we, we text and we talk and uh, we're Facebook friends and, and they know what's going on with me. I know what's going on with them. And, and that has been a real great uh, serendipity. I, I didn't expect it to, to last this long and, and be so tight. But yeah. So you had mentioned um, RRHA, the Richmond uh, Richmond Housing Authority. Mm-hmm. Um, were they a partner in this? How how accessible were they, or how open were they to telling their residents a story? They they were open. Uh, I met with um, I've met with every CEO of the Housing Authority uh, that they've had, except I have not met the current one, and that's not her fault. It's my fault. I just haven't reached out, but. Uh, in the three years I've been working on this, and that's been four different CEOs. <laughs> um, so they've had a little bit of a, of a, a challenge keeping uh, good leadership in there. But I've met with all of them, and they've all been very gracious and helpful and have tried to help us make connections. A lot of the staff there have helped us to make connections. Um, they've been, again, justifiably skeptical when they needed to be. And they've made us define our objectives and, and uh, tell them what we plan to do and how we plan to do it. And I'm glad they did, but they've been, they've been very helpful. And a lot, of, a lot of nonprofits and other organizations that work uh, in those communities have been, I mean, that's, how we, that's how we found folks. We, somebody introduced us to somebody else who introduced us to somebody else. Mm-hmm. And that's the way it's gone. Gotcha. So um, you had mentioned your director, Mark Montgomery, a little bit. Um, how, how did you choose Martin for the project as a producer? Well, I knew that I didn't want to direct it and shoot it myself. Um, I just thought that was, that was one of the things that I learned from, uh, by the grace of Bob is not trying to do too much. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I, I thought 
that I, I wanted to find somebody who would at least be the shooter uh, and, and hopefully director. And so I, I talked to a bunch of folks um, and uh, somebody had recommended uh, Human Story, which is the name of, of the company that, uh, that Bill Gant and, and Martin Montgomery founded and, and run together. And so I just, I called up uh, Bill Gaff and I, I, I didn't know Martin, it, it, it didn't know either one of them. I just called him up and I said, listen, I'm working on this project and I'm looking for a shooter. Can I come talk to you? And so he said, yeah, come on down. And so I met and he invited Martin into the meeting mm -hmm. and I explained what I was trying to do. And, uh, and Bill to his great credit said, you know, I, I don't know that human story as a company is the right way for you to go but there's your dp right there and he pointed to martin and i said okay well let's talk and and martin and i began to talk we had a lunch we had coffee we we got together and we we just kind of developed a chemistry right off the bat and that has become a really good friendship and and a working relationship that has been very very gratifying uh for me anyway i won't speak for martin uh, <laughs> but that yeah that's that's how that happened and uh really grateful for Martin's um, his storytelling chops and the way that he is open to collaboration. He, he hasn't taken a prima donna <clears throat> approach to say, well, I'm the director, you're the producer, you stay over there, I'm going to do my thing. It's been a very collaborative relationship. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, of course, we had mentioned VPM as a co-presenter um, previously. How, how did you approach VPM with this project or you know, what was your vision when you first started on this? Were you thinking, uh, you know, streaming? Were you thinking, you know, VPM? I mean, what, what was your thought process on distribution? Well, we, we uh, see if I can condense this. It was, um, VPM was not a part of the picture early on. Uh, we thought, well, this might be a, a PBS kind of documentary. And I didn't know anything about pitching PBS, but we thought this has some potential. Because it's not just local; it has, it has universal themes and stories that apply nationwide. Uh, so we started off saying, "Okay, well, this is we're just gonna we're gonna do the documentary as Bell Tower Pictures. We're gonna raise the money, and then we're gonna we're gonna take it on the festival circuit because we thought that, that the folks who really need to hear these stories are people who are not necessarily involved with the issues because they know these stories already." But I wanted to introduce these people and these stories to people who had never been into one of the housing communities like me. Mm -hmm. um, and so we thought, well, the film festival circuit might be a good way to do that because that'll let us get that'll give us access to a mainstream audience. And, and maybe we can hit PBS. And then there are thousands and thousands of nonprofits and organizations around the country that work in this space. We thought this could be a valuable tool for them to help interpret the folks that they work with to their funders and donors and, and supporters. And so we'll, we'll try to do an outreach program and connect with those organizations around the country and uh, let them know about the film. And hopefully we can sell them screening licenses or whatever. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's the path we were going and we had raised some money, enough money to do development. We were looking at having to raise another pile of money. And that is my least favorite thing in the world to do. Uh, and one of our board members said, well, you know, I was talking to a friend and they said that uh, VPM uh, has money that they're trying to invest in production. And I said, oh, really? I was very skeptical of that. Uh, I had not heard that news, uh, but I said, OK, I'll check it out. And so I got in contact with John Felton, who was at VPM at the time. It wasn't even VPM at the time. It was still Community Idea Stations. Right. And I began to talk with John and found out, yes, they, they were receptive to, to receiving a proposal and talking about it. And so I put together a proposal, met with John, then, then I met with John and they, they were going through their leadership change at the time. Eventually, John left. Uh, they just brought on uh, Jamie Swain as their CEO. Uh, they just brought on Steve Umble as their chief creative uh, officer. And so John, you know, said, well, Jamie wants to meet with you. So I, I met with Jamie. She wanted to see if I was a real flesh and blood living human being instead of a figment of John's imagination, I guess. I don't know. So, so we, had a, we had a meeting and that went well. And then Steve was on board. So we wanted to, he wanted to meet with Steve. Okay, let's meet with Steve. So we had a good meeting. 
And um, it took a while. I, I don't remember. It seemed like it was like maybe November or so. I think it was November when we first started pitching them and having these conversations. And we finally signed the contract with them in August. So a long period of time. I uh, didn't know what to expect. We, we, in my naivete, I thought, well, this will be a partnership. You know, they'll, they'll contribute some cash and we'll contribute the work and some cash and we'll go halvesies on this thing. Well, it didn't, you know, because of the way they were structured, they, they, uh, they wanted to own it and they wanted to have final uh, content approval. And honestly, that scared me. Uh, and, and initially we said, no, we said, thank you very much. Um, don't think we're going to go down that road because by that time we had begun establishing some really good relationships with our, with our storytellers. And I didn't want to run the risk. I didn't, you know, I'd never worked with BPM before. I didn't know how they were going to want to shape it, if they were going to want to shape it. Right. Especially last, with brand, brand new leaders over there as well. Right. You know, you know, the last thing I wanted was the, you know, the real housewives of Gilpin court kind of <laughs> treatment. Um, and so we, we said no. And then, a couple of our board members said, wait a minute, wait a minute. <laughs> Are we going to go raise all this money? Are we going to sign a piece of paper that gives some rights to VPN, but then they write us a big fat check. And so really it was our board members who pushed me into it. And I'm so glad they did because the relationship has been really, really, really good. Uh, they have not pushed their agenda on us. They have, they have managed this with a very light touch. We have um, driven the, the content. They have not asked for any changes um, to, to the way we were approaching the story. They, they, they looked at the rough cut. They looked at a refined cut. We've been having regular meetings with them. But the input they've given has been, th these are our suggestions. You're the filmmaker. Um, and we made some of their changes that they suggested. Others, we, we felt that um, it didn't fit what we were trying to accomplish. And so I, I can't say enough about the relationship with BPM. It's been, it's been really, really good. So, and this is a question uh, that just popped up on my feed, but no changes at all, not even runtime or anything like that? Yeah, we, the first, the rough cut was two hours. Okay. And, and we thought, you know, I was pitching it to him. I was saying, you know, I know we said this was going to be 90 minutes, but we got, I mean, we probably shot a hundred hours of material. Right. I mean, there's a, there's a pile of stuff. And there's a, we've got some bonus features. If you go to the, to the vpm.org slash herd, they've got a page set up and, and they've got three of them up now. We just sent them the last two little five extra bonus features using some of the material scraped off the cutting room floor. Um, not scraped because it's really good material, yeah. but, but they said, you know, yeah, we'll talk with you about that, but uh, we're hoping this gets picked up by PBS stations around the country. And they made a real strong case to say, uh, chances of, of somebody running you two hours uninterrupted or slim and none, 90 minutes is a stretch. An hour would be perfect, but uh, you, need, you really need to cut it down. And so we did. And of course, they have their the 90 minutes is really 86, 46. And right. so that we had to had to meet that target. But yeah, and, and they made some they made some some good. As I said, they made some good suggestions and we followed some of them. But this is not the typical PBS documentary. There's there's some approaches in the way we handle the storytelling that doesn't fit the normal kind of documentary you'd see on PBS. Uh, and so we felt like we wanted to maintain that that style and that approach and so they were they were agreeable and let us do our thing yeah i mean i would say since the change um to vpm you know i've seen a a, a large bump in quality i would say quality not necessarily um story uh, well i mean well yeah storytelling cinematography um being a little bit more um uh, avant-garde uh you know not a non-traditional broadcast mm -hmm. and so i think heard you know is one of those projects along with you know um passion projects and some of the other things that are coming out this fall that really fit into a, a great bucket for for vpm moving forward yeah and and i think i mean i i don't know 
um, I have met some of the other folks who are doing some projects with them. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, I have not had any long conversations with anybody about this topic. Uh, but my sense is that, yeah, they're, they're finding people that they can trust as storytellers and they're offering light guidance um, and, and letting them do their thing. And that's refreshing. It, it really is yeah. refreshing to be able to do that. Yeah, because we've gone off the deep end. I'm sure they would have said, "No, wait a minute, come on, come on back in the in the right. house. Let's let's talk about this." Right. <laughs> so you know the the name of this program is you know narrative versus documentary. Let's let's go over to the narrative side. And many of you may um, uh, many of you on the Zoom broadcast tonight um, may be familiar with David's film By the Grace of Bob, which has been mentioned a couple of times. Or you may remember it by the original title, Shooting the Prodigal, uh, which was shot right here in Greater Richmond. Um, I'm going to share the, um, uh, the trailer with everyone. If you haven't seen it already, watch it later. Um, but tell me about the gestation about this narrative film, because some people work on narrative films for you know, a decade and finally get that chance to do it. But tell, tell us about where the, the concept came from and what the concept is for those of uh, those of us who don't know. Well, it was not fast. It, um, I guess it, it took birth somewhere in early 2010 and we shot it, um, in the summer of 2015. Uh, I, I was still on staff at First Baptist Church doing their television program, communication kind of things. And, and we had done, uh, a couple of really big, uh, flashy, trashy Christmas music specials outdoors with moving lights and cranes and you know it, uh, they were they were big deals <laughs> really big deals and um, we used a lot of volunteer help on those things and and the folks around the church were saying you know it, even though they were you know coming and volunteering their time from five in the evening till two o'clock in the morning for two weeks to get these things done and um leaving tired and worn out and sleeping through work the next day, uh, they were saying, when are we going to do another one? You know, when are we going to do another one? And my answer had been for a long time, well, let me get over the pain of the last one first, and then we'll talk about the next one. Um, and I'm, I'm really proud of those because they turned out really well and, um, you know, a, a really high slick production standard, I think. Um, but I just could not get excited about putting the church choir out around the bell tower again. You know, I've done it twice. And so I, the, the, the church was very gracious and gave all of us and leadership staff a sabbatical every seven years. Uh, so we were able to take three or four months off to go kind of refresh and rethink what we're going to do when we grow up. And so the church had given me one of those sabbaticals. And in early 2010, I was I remember where I was sitting. I, I was sitting in a, in a restaurant in January on the, on the beach overlooking the Atlantic Ocean in Jekyll Island, Georgia. And I was the only one in the restaurant and I had my little notepad there. And I was thinking, well, you know, okay, what's next? And I had the idea to do a narrative storytelling kind of approach. I didn't know if it would be a, a film or television program, a series. I didn't know. But I thought, you know, okay, that's the next, that's the next thing. But I'd never done anything like that. Um, so I said, okay, I, I'm going to give it a shot. So I came back and talked with a few key people and, they were encouraging. And so I started writing and I had never, I had never written a screenplay before. Really? So this was your first? That was my first. Wow. Um, and so I did it absolutely the wrong way. I started writing the story. <laughs> what do I know? <laughs> open up my computer and open up Microsoft Word and start writing. <laughs> um, and, you know, it didn't take long until I bogged down and I, I realized it wasn't working. Uh, a couple of people came on as as uh, writing partners, and they kind of juiced me up. And mm -hmm. we would get together every week and spend a day writing. And um, that was that was moving forward. It still wasn't very good. And then I began to think, well, okay, I, I better learn some more about this. And so I, I took a class or two from online things, and and um, I got. Uh, McKee's book and uh, Truby and, you know, the, the screenwriting Bibles and started reading those. And I thought, oh, this is how you do this. Right. So then I started a different path and we started writing. We finally, you know, had, had two writing partners. We finally came up with a draft. And, and what I knew I didn't want to do was the typical Christian movie. 
because there were a lot of those out even then. There are a lot more of them out right now. And so many of them are really syrupy and predictable. And um, they just didn't appeal to me at all in terms of trying to communicate some ultimate truth. Mm -hmm. I thought there's got to be a better way to do this than than these kinds of uh, preaching to the choir, uh, reinforcing what you already know kind of storytelling. And so we finished writing this first draft and we read it. And you know what we had? We had the syrupy, stereotypical preaching to the choir <laughs> Christian script. And I said, OK, this is not working. And uh, I, I, the, the, the parable of the prodigal son had always appealed to me. And so that's that's kind of what we were doing was kind of a, an approach on, the, on that story. And, I, and then I went on to IMDb and I started looking around. We were trying to come up with a title. So I started searching and I discovered that there were a handful of other films that had been produced and there were several in production that year on that on that theme. And I thought, well, OK, it was a fun ride. Uh, I've enjoyed it. But th th no, the world doesn't need another one of these. So I told my pastor and my friend Jim Somerville, I said, OK, we're going to uh, it was fun, but no more. I'm going to go back to being stuff that I've been doing here. And he, he was uh, actually talking to his brother and uh, his brother was he asking him about it. And Jim was telling him about it. And, he, and his brother said, you know what you need to do is you need to do a movie about a church making a movie about the parable of the prodigal son. Mm -hmm. and it was like a light bulb came on. I thought, oh, yeah. OK, comedy and kind of borderline mockumentary mm -hmm. satire. That's the way to do this. So we completely you know, went 180 degrees and then started working on that script. Uh, one of the writing partners fell away. We, we continued to write something, had something OK, really were not happy with it, decided to bring in a script doctor. Um, so we did. He worked on it. Uh, my primary writing partner, Deb Hocutt, had had been around uh, literary stuff. She had worked for David Baldacci and, and John Grisham for a while. Through them had met Adriana Trigiani. And uh, she knew Adriana and Adriana agreed to kind of coach us a bit. And she was working on Big Stone Gap at the time. Mm -hmm. uh, and so uh, she coached us on on the script and we finally whipped it into shape. And that's uh, that's probably a longer story than you wanted. But that's that's kind of how we got to the to the shooting script. OK, great. So, um, you know, something that, you know, I always ask writers is um, who reads your first draft? I know you worked with some writing partners, but that to me is, you know, kind of like it's handing over your newborn baby to somebody to hold for the first time. So who gets to read your drafts? Uh, my wife <laughs> read, read the first draft. Um, my, my pastor and friend, Jim Somerville, who is a world-class storyteller, read it. Um, and he is, as I said, he's a world-class storyteller. So he has some chops in that area. So mm -hmm. He advised some. Again, this was my first trip, you know, down this road. So I didn't know. We got some coverage. We, we paid for a couple of coverage sessions on it. Uh, marginally helpful. Uh, Adriana was very helpful in, in the comments that she made, the direction she set us on. So, yeah, um, I, I don't know if uh, there were other. I, and I asked some folks in the business that I knew to uh, to read it and uh, several did uh and and gave us some good input on it yeah. so when did you when did you know that it was ready for production like okay it's kind of a it's good enough draft to go ahead and take it to market and try and start fundraising for it yeah we uh that, that's a that's a hard question to answer because in honestly in, in all honesty it really wasn't ready to start shooting we, we were making changes. We were doing some rewrites during production. Now, that's not unusual. That happens. That happens a lot. But um, again, my first trip down this road, uh, a, a lot of things I I'd love to go back and do another one just to correct some of the stuff that I that I just you, you don't know what you don't know. <laughs> and that's where I was. And so um, a lot of a lot of folks, a lot of great helpers. And that's the way to get any project done. Get good people around you that make you look good. And uh, we had some good people around us that offered some good guidance. Um, uh, 
uh, as we were working through this, this process. I don't remember the exact moment. I remember the board gave us a green light and we still had to raise, we were still raising money when we, when we green lighted it. Um, so we were raising money all the way through production, through post-production, and even for months after production. Um, to do it, if I did it again, I would, I would spend even more time in writing and pre-production before we um, pulled the pull the trigger and, and went into production, I think. And so, how, how many weeks of production did you do? Was it was it four? Uh, my recollection is we did nineteen days. Nineteen days. Wow. Yeah. So, um, you know, you serve as a writer, director. I don't know if you're listed as a producer, but I mean, you certainly were a producer. You know, you as as the originator of this and as a director you probably you did a lot of the production producer type role but what would you say is the big was the biggest challenge with this narrative film um i think i know the answer but um <laughs> yeah. i want everybody else to know trying to identify which was the biggest challenge is is a is a challenge in itself um yeah, I, I, I really didn't want to direct. I tried to find the director and I just couldn't find anybody that, that I felt comfortable handing it off to. Um, so I, I ended up directing and I knew I couldn't do everything. And so I brought the wonderful Ken Roy on as producer first and then Heather Waters joined as a, as a producer. Uh, and, and Ken really ran the, ran the, uh, the railroad as line producer and, and creative producer and Heather um, really did a just they just did a great job as producers on it and I, I guess my role was as producer uh, went away when we started production and I handed that off to them completely. Mm -hmm. um, uh, yeah, the writing as you've heard me say was a real challenge. Um, directing was like driving a Rolls Royce I and mean, we had such a good crew and a good cast. Um, nobody got fired. You know, we didn't fire anybody. Maybe you were too nice. <laughs> Maybe, I don't know. Uh, that's not to say there weren't challenges and, and difficult personality clashes from time to time. There were, mm -hmm. um, but we had, we had just a great crew. And so it's, um, it was one of those dream uh, 19 day shoots where everybody enjoyed coming to the set every day. I think uh, I certainly did. And it, it worked well. Gloriana Wills was our first AD and she was, she is, she is wonderful. She, uh, I've, it, it's unusual that somebody can, can uh, hit their targets every day uh, in doing the breakdowns and saying, okay, you're going to have to go two hours overtime this day. And Ken said, no, we can't do that. And lo and behold, at the end of the day, we were two hours overtime. And I mean, she just, she knew what she was doing. She's just a, a whiz bang at doing that. So uh, that part was, was, uh, was great. Post-production was tough uh, because we, we overshot. We had, we had, I don't know, we probably had 10 pages of script that we ended up cutting. Um, and that was very painful. Man, that's painful. <laughs> yeah. So, so what, what, what was your, um, what was your shooting draft? And then, you know. Oh gosh, I can't remember the page count. Um, it, it was, it was right at 90 pages though. I mean, we were shooting for an hour and a half. Um, as we, we screened, we did a screening for family and friends in the bird theater. Mm -hmm. uh, and we, we did post, that was another thing we did too fast. We did post too fast. Uh, somebody had given us some marginal advice that we needed to take this to the AFM, American Film Market in California in November. Well, we wrapped production in the middle of July. Um, as it turns out, AFM was a complete waste of time and money. Uh, would never do that again. I just uh, kind of tell everybody what AFM is and you know what it's like kind of walking into that room yeah it's a uh, for, for people who are market. Market. yeah it's it's one of uh i guess three or four major film markets can is one of them toronto berlin afm is the united states biggest film market everybody goes to santa monica california they they completely take over two hotels 
and all the distributors and, 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 you know, moguls have these suites and you go in and it's, um, it's a, it's a market for people to, to buy and sell films. Um, and it's not really designed for filmmakers to go and find a distributor, which is what we were trying to do. It's, it's not really not marketed to be that kind of market. It's built for people who have films companies to go sell those markets to Australia television or to whatever, or to theater chains. Uh, but we, we had heard, I'd done on, on enough research and there were some who thought, well, this, this is a good opportunity. So, so we did that. And Heather Waters did an outstanding job of lining up appointments. I think we had 19 or 20 appointments with different potential distributors before we even uh, landed in Santa Monica which is really <laughs> saying a lot because uh, most, a lot of them don't want to talk to, to filmmakers. They want to talk to buyers. Um, so anyway, all that to say, we, we rushed through post-production and we did a screening uh, for family and friends in the Bird Theater in October, like three weeks before we were to go to AFM. And we got a lot of good input from folks who saw it there that, you know, the first half was dragging. It was too long. We needed to cut, 15 minutes out of the first half of the film. Mm. And so that's what we did for the next three weeks. Uh, we just, we burned the midnight oil and got it down to a manageable, um, I think 92 minutes is the final runtime mm -hmm. and, and took it to AFM. It still wasn't completely finished. There was a little bit of work that still needed to be done, but we, we uh, hopped on the plane took it out there and marketed it or tried to market it. Um, but the toughest part, and, and your guess is right, was marketing the sucker. And um, that, you know, made a lot of mistakes in the marketing and distribution and um, too many to, to list here. But um, that led to that uh, symposium that we helped work with VPA and, and uh, several folks worked together, to put together this marketing finance and distribution seminar yeah. symposium. Uh, where we tried to help other folks learn some of the mistakes that we made. Right. And uh, the bottom line is you got to take responsibility for your own distribution. You know, there, there, there are very few films and, and paths to distribution success where you make a film and you sell it to a distributor and they write you a big fat check that pays for all of your production expenses and then pays for your Mercedes and your next 10 house payments. And then they take it and it goes around the world and everybody's rich and famous just does not happen that way. There are very few instances where that happens. And so we discovered that pretty quickly. What, so what you've got to do is find your own audience and you've got to cultivate your own audience. And so the, the upshot of all that is take, take responsibility, uh, engage your audience, know who you're, who is going to be out there that's interested in your film and find ways to connect with those folks. And uh, the response, that's one of the lessons we learned. And that's what we've done on H.E.R.D. And uh, our associate producer, Angie Kane, has done an amazing job of connecting with, uh, we've called them influencers and affinity group leaders all around the country uh, who are now, uh, you know, we're, we're fielding questions and inquiries every day for people wanting to do screenings of the film. And it hasn't even aired yet. And it'll go to the APT marketplace, American Public Television marketplace next week, as a matter of fact. And we're hoping that PBS stations will pick it up. And we, we've, uh, we've concentrated on the top 10 markets in the country, top 10 television markets, to try to cultivate those uh, influencers and affinity group leaders. So when those PBS stations pick it up, we've got their phone numbers, we've got their email addresses, and we can say, hey, this is when it's going to air in your market. You're, you're cleared hot to go. Great. So my question before we kick it over to the live Q&A um, or folks that want to, uh, you know, please queue up your questions in the chat. Those are going to come first. Um, but which one do you prefer, narrative or documentary? Because if, if someone came to you and said you could only do one for the rest of your career, which one are you going to choose? Yeah, Martin Montgomery and I were having this conversation on the phone yesterday, as a matter of fact. And um uh, and I said, you know, Martin, it has been such a joy working with you on this thing because you do what you do so well. Mm -hmm. And I don't have to worry about doing your job. You do your job and you do it better than I can do it. Mm -hmm. Let me do what I can do and what I can contribute. 
and I'm just more comfortable. I, I know the documentary world. I've worked in that world, you know, all of my career, just about uh, predominantly in that in that genre. And so I feel much more at home there. On the other hand, I learned so much on Bob that I would love to have another chance to uh, to put some of those things that I learned into practice. And Martin said, well, what if I told you I had a screenplay? <laughs> so, <laughs> I don't know. We, we may, uh, we may do, I, I don't know. You never say never. Uh, I don't know what's next. We're, we're working on another documentary. Uh, we've, we've already started doing development on, on our second documentary. And um, I had, I have had and still have several ideas and, and uh, uh, concepts for some narrative um projects um, that may come to fruition. But, you know, I turned 70 years old this coming January. Uh, I, I still f have a lot of energy, feel good, and, and, and think I can and go for a, a while longer. But I, I'm going to pick and choose what I do from here on out pretty carefully. Mm -hmm. I don't want to spend any time doing something that's not fulfilling. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so Roger, Roger Hummel, uh, has the first uh, question out of the queue. Let me try to unmute you. And Lauren, can you help me out? Or Lindsay, there we go. Roger, you're up. <laughs> well, well, this is great, David. So, um, you know, uh, you know, a after, you know, oh my God, you know, more than, than 18 years uh, in, in the news industry, you know, and I'm sure kind of like with you, where uh, the uh, story is filtered through reporters or through, you know, through folks that are not really involved there. Uh, I find that the, the, the truest uh, part of telling a story is through those folks that are there, you know, through, through uh, characters. And I'll just wrap it by saying that uh, strong characters tell a good story. Uh, do you want to comment on that? Absolutely. Yeah. <clears throat> we, uh, we, uh, we, I don't think we could have found uh, better storytellers than we ha have in our film. And it's not because of the brilliance of the questions we ask them um, or them trying to perform for us in any sense. As a matter of fact, we had, um, we, we shot more stories than, are, than show up in the film. And there, there was one person that we were, we shot a good bit of footage with that you know, Martin and I looked at each other one day and it kind of occurred to us that this person was kind of doing uh, reality TV and maybe this wasn't this person's real personality. It was more of a performance for us, for the camera. And so we, we dropped that one um, pretty shortly thereafter. But these folks, are, are they're just being themselves and they're telling their stories. And it's, it's one of those... Uh, you know, as we go through every every time we sit down with these folks, it's a, a an OMG moment. I I had no idea. My goodness, I live out here in suburbia, and uh, I, I've never heard gunshots ringing in my neighborhood. But these folks are trained and know what to do when they hear gunshots because they hear them all the time. That's just one example. Um, and so, just to stop and listen to folks tell their stories. Is, is an incredible enriching experience. Um, and so, yeah, I think that's the best storytelling in, in news or documentary or anything else. I don't know if that really gets at what you were, what you were saying, Roger. Oh, oh absolutely. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, I, I just wondered if that changed uh, your direction, your perspective on documentary versus narratives where documentary you're scripting versus documentary, I mean, versus narratives, where you just have to start throwing things out. You have to really just start, uh, you know, really, uh, you know, uh, b being pretty brutal with what folks are saying and really trying to distill that story. Yeah, we let them talk. You know, my <clears throat> one of my little golden rules of, uh, of interviewing for documentary is um, <clears throat> when I ask, when, when we ask the last question, shut up and leave the camera on. And some of the best stuff comes out then. I'm sure you've had this experience. Um, and every time we, we go and have another interview with, with one of these folks, same thing happens. It, it's, it just took us 
a direction that we didn't expect to go. And it was it was a wonderful direction. And we learned some things, but it, it, it changed me as a human being. Um, it, it really did from from being someone who I, I don't think I ever really thought I knew all the answers or knew what all the problems were. But it has underscored how very little I know about people outside of my immediate circle and my skin color and my socioeconomic group, whatever that is. Uh, we really tend to live in silos. Uh, even those of us who who try to get out, um, it, it takes effort. It's not easy. And that has become uh, crystal clear to me through this three-year process. Great. Thanks, Roger. Uh, the next question is coming from Dawn Womack. If I Dawn. can <laughs> unmute her. Dawn's, hey. Dawn's father-in-law was one of the people who read uh, the, one of the early drafts of um, Shooting the Prodigal. Uh, Joe Womack, her, her father-in-law, was on staff with me at First Baptist Church and one of my dearest confidants and friends. So, hi, Dawn. Hi, David. How are you? I'm good. Yeah. Good. I have a question for you. It is uh, in, re in relation to production in terms of cost and different budget line items you had to consider between the narrative and the documentary, um, was there a drastic difference in cost and what was different between those two productions? Uh, when I budgeted for the documentary, I budgeted uh, as a pretty high end documentary and I, I budgeted to take in a sound person. I budgeted to take in a second camera person. I budgeted for an AC. I budgeted for grip and electric. Uh, all those things that you would budget for in a narrative, um, I budgeted for in the documentary. Um, it became obvious early on that you cannot roll into Gilpin Court with a semi-trailer full of, of dollies and, and, um, and lights. Um, it just would not work. Uh, you, can't, you, you can't operate with that kind of environment. And so... Uh, we, we revised the budget pretty quickly when the reality began to hit us that it, this was going to be run and gun. Uh, you know, we set up lights here and there, and we, we hired a sound person here and there. But mostly it was Martin and me and uh, Angie Kane, our associate producer. Uh, two of us, or at most the three of us, uh, on, on any shoot day, for the most part, a few exceptions. Uh, so that that was one big difference. The, the budget was a lot larger for for uh, by the grace of Bob. Uh, obviously, you know, talent and and all of the crew positions and whatnot that um, that we didn't uh, need to, to budget for with the documentary. So the documentary was mm, l much less than half the budget of by the grace of Bob. Does that answer okay. your question? It absolutely does. Thank you very much. Good to see you. Good to see you. So, David, um, you know, something that we've, I think we've both talked about with our friend Craig Martin is the white savior complex. Um, I mean, you know, as as you're going into Gilpin Court, you know, and we've talked about the barriers there, but um, I mean, how much does that internally weigh on you? When, when doing this project? Uh, constantly. Um, you know, I, I just read an article in Documentary Magazine. I don't know, maybe some, some others uh, get that magazine. It's published by the International Documentary Association. The new edition just came out and I just got it in the mail the other day. And I just read this morning or yesterday, I think it was this morning, an article in that that was really challenging me again uh, that talked about you know, um, they didn't word it this way, but it was the, the challenge was, well, who are you, middle class white guy going into a predominantly black neighborhood to tell their stories? They ought to be telling their stories. Um, well, we, we recognized that early on. Um, and so we, we tried to bring in people on the, on the team, uh, people of color and people, I mean, one of the first people I talked to about this project to try to get some perspective was a young man. Well, he's not young anymore. He's 40 years old, but I had known him when he was a teenager and lived in Gilpin Court. 
And so I called up Omar and I said, we sat down and talked for two hours. Well, he talked for two hours and I listened to him tell his experiences of growing up in, in the projects. And that helped kind of begin to get my mind around uh, how I was going to need to to approach this. But I think I think we've always got to be conscious that that there is a difference in our lived experiences and and sometimes the people who we're that we're pointing the camera at. And if if we don't have a, a minimum understanding of that, then we need to work extra hard to to gain that perspective. And and so we were conscious of that all the way through and the 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 concept of trying to be a white savior, boy, they have seen so many people come through with solutions to their problems. And one of the things that it plays out a little bit in the film, but there's a there's a, another narrative in one of those little bonus features where one of the guys talks about how, you know, people come in and when this, when somebody gets shot, there was a weekend when something like four people got killed in Gilpin Court in one weekend. And all these folks at churches and different ones come in the next week, they want to do a prayer walk in Gilpin Court and the mayor shows up. Not that he shouldn't show up, not that churches shouldn't show up, but that's when they show up. A week later, where are they? (laughs) They're back in their office uh, and nothing has changed. That's We heard that over and over again. Nothing has changed. And so what really has, has hit home with me is that that um, if you really want to help, first of all, just listen. Don't come in with your agenda. Just shut up and listen. And the needs of the community will become clear over a period of time. And it will become clear what you can do to help if you're of a mind to help. And most of the time, it appears to me that the solutions are right there in those communities. Folks are smart. They're industrious. Uh, they can solve their problems. One of the things that they don't have are, are resources. And so to be able to help these folks acquire resources in uh, a meaningful, sensitive way is one of the ways that we can help. But uh, just going in there and throwing cash or throwing solutions is not the way to, to go about this. And, and that's that's where that white savior complex comes from. Um, and I've really been sensitized to that, trying to, I mean, even saying this, I'm, I'm, I'm sitting here as if I know the answers, right? I don't. I'm telling you, I don't, because I don't have that experience of growing up there. I'm just been a pure to say what them say. Um, let's help ourselves. I just got to notice that my internet connection was unstable. Are you still seeing? Yeah, 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 yeah. You're breaking up just a little bit. Um, I've just got one last question from um, Alan Cavito. Um, he asked, um, how. Uh, the on-camera subjects reacted to having a camera on them. Uh, did they play to the camera or just let it melt away and just tell their honest stories? I know you had talked about the one that were was kind of playing up, um, you know, their emotions. But how about the other subjects that that made the cut? Yeah, that very question was asked during the the um, the virtual Q and A during the Virginia Film Festival, and I, I thought it was interesting the way each one of them answered that. Uh, some of them were were nervous and conscious of the camera at first, but then began to relax the further we went along um, and deeper we got into it and just relaxed and, and told their stories. But uh, one or two of them were, you know, they were they were a little nervous and conscious of the camera being there. Um, but I think they're right now that I you know kind of review how the, the year or so went with them that they they did begin to relax and. And I, I think it was, I think we do that, we being Martin and myself do this naturally is to try to uh, not call attention to the technology and, and setting up the camera and, and all of that stuff. We, we try to talk with them and, and put them at ease and assure them that, okay, you know, we're, we're on your side. We want to, we want to help you tell your story the best way you can. If you mess up and want to start over, fine. We got, we got plenty of disk space here. We can, we can do that all day long. And so I think, 
continually reassuring them that, uh, that they were in control of their stories, help them to relax. Well, David, thank you for your time tonight. I really appreciate it. And hopefully that, you know, everyone who is participating um, as well. Uh, the next um, Zoom cast for the VPA is coming up on November 19th. Um, it's going to be with uh, Tom Belgray, um, SAG actor. Um, you may have seen them on Nashville or Castle Rock or Watchmen or um, Steve's Killer Quota, <laughs> my 48 hour project from a couple of years ago. Um, he's also a member of our uh, of the VPA board. Um, and then that one's also going to be hosted by Don Womack, who asked a question earlier. She's a riot. I'm expecting um, hilarity and a lot of entertainment from everyone. So um, please mark your calendars on November 19th at 7 p.m. for the next one. And um, if, uh, if you have any other questions, David, how can, uh, how can people reach you? Are you on Twitter, Instagram? Yeah, Facebook. Uh, best way is just email me, dpowers at belltowerpictures.com. Um, and I, I generally respond to email. So yeah, glad to hear from anybody.